Okay, so why don't you go ahead and uh, introduce yourself. And uh, I'm Cliff May. I'm the president of something called the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. It's a policy institute, a think tank sometimes called, on terrorism, and it was formed uh, almost immediately after 9-11-2001. Okay, hold on. Okay, yeah. getting a home over here. Oh, is that the air conditioner? You want the... Okay, why don't you go ahead and just uh, introduce yourself again. I'm uh, Cliff May. I'm the president of something called the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies, which is a policy institute, sometimes called a think tank. It was formed almost immediately after 9-11-2001 to focus specifically on the issue of terrorism, and, and democracy and creating the institutions of democratic government. And when you look at uh, the role of the United States, what do you see as kind of your vision for what the role of the United States should be in the world? Well, I mean, I think that's part of what we want to develop through research. I'm and sorry, but also, I, I, my oh. question, I'm not going to be including my, my questions. Oh, right, right, right. Uh, what we're trying to do, what we've been trying to do for almost three years now, is look at the phenomenon of terrorism and who it targets and develop as best we can policies that can help um, def successfully de defend democratic societies from terrorists and from the ideologies that both justify and drive terrorism. Uh, the other side of the coin is freedom and human rights and democratic government. Um, it seems to us that where those things flourish, you're unlikely to be also uh, finding terrorism thriving. And so we have run democracy programs, for example, uh, with women in, in Iraq to help uh, women understand democratic governance better. Um, it's a hard thing if you're an Iraqi to understand because under Saddam Hussein you had no access to any materials about it. You know people vote, you know people get freedom of speech, but that's pretty much it. So part of what we're trying to do is promote uh, freedoms, human rights, democratic government, and in regard to human rights in particular, we think very important are the are, are, are freedom of worship and also women's rights. A society that disenfranchises women is unlikely to be a successful and prosperous society, and by definition, it's not an entirely free society. And when you look at democratic societies, can you speak to uh, law and the role that law plays? Yeah. Uh, when we talk about democratic societies, it means more than just the right to vote, for example. People don't always understand that. Uh, de democracy does not mean that uh, two wolves sit down with a sheep and vote on what to have for dinner. When we talk about democratic societies and democratic institutions, what we mean are such things as the, as the rule of law and an ind independent judiciary and a free press um, and a way for citizens to choose or at least consent to who governs them. Um, and probably property rights are a very important component of that as well. And you can prioritize this, but those are the kinds of concepts that people need to understand. And by the way, even here in the West or here in the United States, I think we don't necessarily understand these concepts very well. Uh, we operate within them perfectly well, but that's not the same. It's like saying, well, I can drive a car, but that doesn't mean I could build a car or even fix a car. And when we talk about a country that has lived under tyranny, where you're trying to bring democratic institutions, you have to do more than operate a system that's already in use. You have to create systems. And that's a very tricky thing to do. It has not been very successfully done very many times in history. It has happened, but, not, but it's not been easy. And when you speak to the uh, rule of law, can you elaborate as the importance of the rule of law? Well, I think the rule of law is a very important component of, uh, of, of democratic governance. You should know what the laws are. You should know whether there's a way to change the laws. You should know whether or not you're breaking a law and what the consequences of that are. In a country that is run by a despot, the law is whatever is written above his name. Uh, in a country like Iraq under Saddam Hussein, um, somebody who had done nothing wrong didn't know in what way he had, for example, offended Saddam Hussein, could find himself dragged off uh, to prison, could find himself very severely punished. A friend of mine, Don North, has done a documentary called Remembering Saddam. It's the story of seven Iraqis, all of whom had their right arms amputated by Saddam Hussein, not having done anything that anybody listening to this would consider to be a crime. And uh, when you look at uh the, uh, the, the role of the United Nations. How does the role, how do you see the role of the United Nations? I, uh, the role of the United Nations has been disappointing. 
the United Nations is uh, an organization comprised of democratic countries and dictatorial countries. And institutionally, the United Nations doesn't appear to have a preference of one over the other. The United Nations has a human rights commission um, that ignores gross human rights violations all over the world. In fact, representatives of the UN know that if your country has done something just egregiously bad in the area of human rights, the best thing you can do is get yourself named to the Human Rights Commission and then there'll never be any condemnation of you. Uh, the United Nations does not have a working definition of terrorism, for example, uh, as well. So I think the United Nations at this point in its history is problematic in this regard. Okay, and uh, when you look at was that okay? With the it's probably okay. I mean, I think it's picked up lately, but I thought okay. it was in here. I'm oh, sure no. It's, it's just the uh, phone in the background. Uh, when you look at um, the role of debate as a form of education, uh, can you speak to kind of what the, the press should ideally do as, as a form of providing, in, in terms of providing a form for debate? Well, I mean, the role of the press. Um, the press, I think, has many roles, and there are very important roles. Uh, the press's role should be one to, just to get the news, to tell people what's going on in their own community, in their own country, and in the world. Uh, then there are various perspectives that need to be brought to bear on any issue. You should be able to find out through reading the press what are the various proposals and solutions and what is the debate, and you should be able to get to see both sides, maybe more than one, two sides uh, of any particular debate. Um, the press should be free to investigate and to root out corruption. Again, these are, uh, these are important tasks that be performed in a democratic society. They're tasks that are not performed at all in a despotic dictatorship, such as Iraq, for example, such as North Korea, for example. There is, there is, now, of course, Iraq today, post Saddam Hussein, very much has a free press. There are literally scores of newspapers of Every kind of every sort, uh, representing some that that really try to do the news, and some that represent a particular ideology or opinion. Um, it's a huge marketplace of ideas right now. Um, it's certainly preferable to what you had in the past. And uh, when you look at the time period uh, leading up to the military intervention in Iraq, how would you evaluate the performance of uh, both the print and television news media? Uh, overall, nothing to be terribly proud of. I'm sorry, what is Okay. Overall, I don't think the press in, in, in the months and in the years leading up to uh, what I would call the liberation of Iraq from Saddam Hussein uh, performed particularly well. We know that in order to have bureaus in Baghdad, any number of media outlets, including the most, some of the most important, essentially agreed that they would not investigate the gross violations of human rights being committed by Saddam Hussein. They wouldn't look into or report on the mass executions. Um, they wouldn't uh, reveal the, uh, the, the mass graves. They wouldn't talk about the torture being inflicted, the rape rooms that were used against those considered enemies of the regime, uh, the genocidal uh, attacks against the Kurds, um, the, the arbitrary arrests, the amputations, the beheadings. Um, r right now you can see, I have a, in this office, uh, tapes that, that Saddam had taken of torture and executions carried out under his regime. They are very difficult to watch. You see people having their fingers and their arms chopped off. You see people taken in handcuffs to the top of buildings and thrown off. And you see them wildly spinning their legs in the air, hoping that they can manage to land on their legs, not on their back or their head or their side, and they usually don't succeed. Uh, you see people being beheaded with swords. These are people who have, may not have had any trial or have committed any crime whatsoever. I do not think that the American or the European or any other press revealed any of this to, a, to any extent prior to the liberation of Iraq, and I don't think they've done a very good job of revealing it since the liberation of Iraq. And uh, when you talk, do you consider uh, the re liberation of Iraq as a humanitarian intervention? I do consider, I consider that the liberation of Iraq was justified, among other things, as a humani from a humanitarian point of view, just as the intervention in Kosovo and Bosnia were, um, except that Saddam Hussein was, uh, had, had done much, much that, w that was worse. He is responsible for killing more Muslims than probably any figure in world history. He attempted genocide against the Kurdish people. He sponsored terrorists and harbored terrorists in the country. He
He not only made weapons of mass destruction, he used them. He used chemical weapons of mass destruction against the Kurds. We know that at least until 1995 uh, that he was working on uh, biological weapons of mass destruction. We know that because his son-in-law, Kamal Hussein, had defected and revealed that in 1996. Kamal Hussein would pay for telling us that with his life. Uh, as for nuclear weapons, we know that in 1991, uh, 1990, when we had the first Gulf War, he was further along in developing nuclear weapons than most intelligence analysts thought. Um, I, I kind of think that he probably didn't get very far with nuclear weaponry after 1991 till 2003 when we toppled him, but I think he had it in his plans when the pressure was off to do. Um, so I think it was very much justified, and I think and certainly the Iraqis that I work with, the Iraqis I know, are very glad to have that tyranny lifted from their shoulders, though there's a great challenge in establishing freedom and human rights and democracy in Iraq on a, on, as an ongoing project. I don't think there are any guarantees of that. But Saddam Hussein was one of the worst tyrants of the end of the 20th uh, century and the beginning of the 21st. And uh, the executive director of um, Human Rights Watch, Kenneth Roth, in January came out with an article saying that Iraq should not be considered a humanitarian intervention. Did you see his article? I did not see uh, Kenneth Ross's article on that. Okay. And he argues that, uh, you know, there are actual legal proceedings that could have been taken up to indict Saddam as a war criminal back in the early 90s uh, that were not taken, but that also that there was no evidence of either imminent or ongoing genocide. Um, well, I think the evidence of genocide against the Kurds is pretty clear. Uh, I think it's, uh, we know that chemical weapons were used, we've seen the films, um, we know of the uh, on, on campaign, we know uh, that, uh, I mean, we've seen the pictures of women and their babies lying down in the streets and dying. I don't think Kenneth Roth wants to challenge the concept that Saddam Hussein tried to, I mean, committed genocidal atrocities against the Kurds. Um, as well as terrible crimes, whether you call it genocide or not, against the Marsh Arabs of the South. Um, for thousands of years, they've had a distinctive environment of wetlands that they've lived in, and he drained that. He drained that and forced hundreds of thousands of them probably to leave, and many, many, many were killed. I think it's, I don't know why anyone, particularly from a group like Human Rights Watch, would want to minimize these crimes. Now, should we have indicted him a long time ago? Yeah, I wish we would. I wish we had. And I wish the international community had responded in a forceful way to stop the genocide in Rwanda. The international community, the United Nations, did not. I wish the international community had responded in a forceful way uh, in Cambodia before uh, the Cambodians were killed by the, I guess, by the millions, by the Khmer Rouge. The UN, the international community, again, did not. Um, I know that the international community, or the United States, really, cannot intervene every time there is a terrible dictator who is doing awful things to his people or the people of his region. But I also don't want to give any guarantees to these dictators that they never have to worry about anything because there is a long procedure that has to be gone through before anything can happen to them. I think, uh, I, I think that's a mistake. Again, I think we should be ashamed of what we didn't do in places like Cambodia and Rwanda. And I think that uh, history will find clearly that the liberation of Iraq was a noble cause. And do you have any additional information as to why the United States decided not to take action on Human Rights Watch in the early 90s when they came, saying, let's, you know, they, Human Rights Watch says that they went to every country they could go yeah. to? I have no idea what Human Rights Watch did or did not do in the 1990s. I'm just not familiar with, 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 with okay. their efforts. Um, and let's see, the, when you look at, um, on September 18th, 2002, uh, George Bush says that it's an important goal for the world to see that this country is united in a resolve to deal with the threats that we face. And he was referring to the, ongoing, the upcoming congressional uh, resolution that was uh, going to be passed in, in October 10th and 11th. So can you speak to um, what George Bush meant uh, by that? Well, I'm, I'm not sure I'm uniquely qualified to tell you what George Bush had in mind. Um, I think I better directed the administration. I, I would say this, that I think the President Bush did recognize that there were humanitarian interests. I don't think he stressed it as much as he should have. We, 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 we certainly urged that. Uh, one of the groups we worked with was a group called Women for a Free Iraq. This is prior to the liberation. And these women were trying very hard to make the point that the human rights situation in Iraq for years had been dreadful 
and that there needed to be some relief of that. Um, they did get to go to the White House on two occasions and make that case to the president, and we helped to facilitate that. They did go, go to Capitol Hill, and they did do a reasonable amount of media, though there was less media interest than I might have thought. I can remember one time being on a bus with members of the Women for a Free Iraq campaign, which, con which, which consisted of Sunni and Shia and Kurdish women, and there were those signs that we passed saying, no war in Iraq, and the women got really upset seeing that. And I remember one of them saying to me, I don't understand what this means. We're not asking for a war on Iraq. There is a war taking place in Iraq. Saddam is waging it against us, against me, my relatives, my friends. We're asking that America help us stop the war that Saddam is waging against the people of Iraq. And I said, that's the message you have to get across to people. And if you don't do it, I don't know who will. Now, I also think that President Bush thought, particularly in light of 9-11, and I think this is still true today, that the most important risk facing the United States is that terrorists enabled by rogue regimes will be supplied with weapons of mass destruction. And certainly when you think about that, Saddam Hussein seems to be a problem. He is somebody who has declared himself, had declared himself our enemy. We knew what his intentions were. We didn't necessarily know what his capabilities were because our intelligence was not as good as it should have been, but we had some concept based on the fact that he had developed weapons of mass destruction, and worse, he had used weapons of mass destruction against his enemies, and he considered us among his enemies. Now, in response to that, you can do two things. You can say, I'm going to take action unless he shows us, shows the world, as he agreed to do in exchange for the ceasefire of 1991, that he has accounted for his weapons of mass destruction and he has destroyed his weapons of mass destruction. Or you can say, you know what, I'm going to cross my fingers and hope that nothing bad comes of this. I don't think that was a prudent policy to cross one's fingers and hope. We had tried it before. Throughout the 1990s, we knew that about 20,000 terrorists were being trained, mainly in Afghanistan, also in Iraq, places like Salman Pak, where there was a fuselage of a airplane to train terrorists and the uh, Ansar al-Islam camp in the uh, northern, uh, northeastern part, and in, to an extent in Lebanon and in Syria. But at least 20,000 terrorists were trained during the 1990s. We didn't close one of those camps. We didn't infiltrate the organizations responsible. We didn't follow the terrorists afterwards. We crossed our fingers and hoped nothing bad would happen. And what happened was 9-11. So the question is, do we go back to the policies of 9-10? Of, uh, of or do we uh, go uh, with the new and reform policies that President Bush has constructed? Or is there something better? I'm open to anyth anything like that. But the idea that after the 1990s, when we simply refused to recognize and appreciate the threat we faced from terrorists, despite the fact that they attacked us for the first time in the World Trade Center in 1993, and, uh, and uh, Osama bin Laden trained terrorists brought down a Black Hawk helicopter the same year in Mogadishu, and in 1996, we were attacked in Kobar Tower in Saudi Arabia. In 1998, two of our embassies were hit. And in 2000, uh, the USS Cole was hit. Despite all that, we didn't really do anything about terrorism or terrorist training camps. After 2001 and now, I just think it's irresponsible to say, oh, well, let's just cross our fingers and, and hope. And, and maybe we can do some things to make ourselves less offensive to those who have been trained to kill us. And when you look at um, Saddam Hussein, do you see Iraq. Do you see Iraq as a threat? Was I, I, Iraq a threat? I think Saddam Hussein was a threat. I think he was because Saddam Hussein said it was a threat. We went to war with Saddam Hussein, who clearly had the ambition to become an oil-rich, uh, nuclear-armed, biological and chemical-armed uh, emperor of the Middle East. He obviously intended to swallow Kuwait. He attempted to do so and would have done so if the United States had not intervened. Uh, I don't think the UN or anybody else was going to do anything about that if the United States did not. Um, he had designs on Saudi Arabia and other countries in the region as well. He had fought a huge war, of course, uh, with Iran. No friend of ours at that point in history. Uh, but nonetheless, it showed his intentions. In 1991, after we forced him out of Kuwait, we signed not a peace treaty, but a ceasefire. He had to undertake certain obligations in exchange for that ceasefire, in exchange for staying in his palaces, he did not fulfill his obligations under, the, under those treaties or under, those, uh, under that ceasefire, uh, nor did he uh, fulfill the obligations imposed upon him to which he theoretically agreed 
by the United Nations Security Council in more than a dozen resolutions. Did we? Did the United States therefore act in self-defense? Uh, yeah, that's a definitional thing. Whether it's definitional to say whether it was, was an act of self-defense, um, we I, I would argue we had been at war. We were at war with Saddam Hussein starting in 1990, 1991. That war didn't end. It was a ceasefire. If Saddam Hussein didn't live up to his obligations, we had every right to declare the ceasefire null and void, and to return to uh, the conflict. Um, uh, in order to uh, force either force him to do what we had demanded and what he had agreed to, or uh, to remove him from power. I think the more humanitarian course was to remove him from power because after we left him in power in 1991, he killed tens of thousands of Iraqis. Um, and I think we bear some responsibility for that because we encouraged them to rise up against him. And they did, the Shia did, and the Kurds did. And then when he went and began to mow them down, we did nothing about it. So I do think that uh, we had a, a right and a responsibility to do something uh, about his brutality. No so, one else would have. So in other words, our, our actions were not in self-defense then? Um, the question of self, look, you can say on the one hand that he was a growing threat that we had to act against. You can say that it was a humanitarian intervention. You can say that as long as he was sponsoring terrorism and we were in a war against terrorists, we had every right to do that. I think it's, he was a threat. He was a growing threat uh, to us, and he was somebody who had committed crimes against humanity. And I think from, every, from those and other points of view, it was absolutely justified uh, to remove him from power. Now, when you speak of the ceasefire agreement, um, can you just give a little bit of your expertise on international law or what international lawyers are referring to when you refer to 687 resolution? Well, I'm, I'm not an international lawyer, and I'm not, uh, I don't think I can go through all the resolutions. I mean, the most obvious one is, of course, is simply 1441, which said, which everyone on the Security Council agreed to, which said that he was not in compliance, he was in violation, that he hadn't fulfilled his obligations, that he hadn't met the terms of the UN resolutions, he hadn't disclosed where his weapons of mass destruction were, what he had done with them, he hadn't destroyed them in a verifiable manner, and that serious consequences would follow. Uh, again, you need to go to international lawyers for international lawyer uh, expressions of this, but I think at that point um, it was pretty clear that serious consequences would follow as 1441 said, and the serious consequences were what happened. So from your sense in the international legal community, do they uh, believe that uh, the legal argumentation of the United States that they gave forth with the ceasefire 687, 678, and there is a dispute within the, within, among international lawyers. Don't forget, international law is not like domestic law. You do not have a Supreme Court. You don't have one body that can say, this is what international law is, and this is how international law operates in, in, in this uh, particular circumstance. Uh, international law has to do with customary law. It has to do with treaties. It has to do with obligations. It's not all that clear cut. There are always going to be uh, some disagreements. It's a disproportionality. It, it seems to me from the international lawyers I've talked to, the overwhelming consensus is that the legal argumentation that the United States was putting forth was strained. Um, I think it would be very difficult for you to quantify what international lawyers have said, and, and I'm not sure, and I would question how you did that, how many hundreds of international lawyers did you talk to in order to get that. But even if you did, again, the way international law works is not that you take a survey of international lawyers and the majority of international lawyers decide what international law is. International law is a, is a lot muddier than that. And I guess what I'm, I'm getting at is that, you know, the ceasefire agreement, there's a difference between a bilateral ceasefire agreement and a Chapter 7 Union Security Council resolution that's binding. That's right. There's a, there's a difference between a ceasefire agreement and the and Chapter 7 UN Security Council resolutions. I would argue that Saddam Hussein was in violation of both. But uh, 687 was a Chapter 7 Security Council resolution. It wasn't a bilateral uh, agreement that you can just say it's the armistice is no longer valid and we're going to resume hostilities. And that wasn't the way the President, the President, uh, President Bush could have taken that course. He didn't necessarily need to go to the UN. He didn't necessarily need UN Security Council resolutions on Iraq. He was urged to do that by Colin Powell, I believe, and certainly by uh, Tony Blair, Prime Minister of, of Britain. But he could have done it another way. 
for example, when President Clinton intervened, rightfully, I would argue, in the Balkans, in Bosnia and Kosovo, he did not go to the UN for approval. Um, now, you may say, well, that too was a violation of international law, and I'm sure you can find international lawyers who will say it's a violation of international law. But again, international law is not like American domestic law where you can say, well, we took it to the Supreme Court, so it's established. It just doesn't work that way. And can you explain to me what John Negroponte might have meant when he said there are no hidden triggers or no automaticity in 1441? I think you'll have to go to John Negroponte to explain it. I don't think I'm the best person to be explaining what, uh, dip what diplomats are, are saying in their, in their language. Okay, and when you look at the... Uh, the television news coverage, um, and it, I guess it, w by working at the New York Times, you know, how do you see like the New York Times as um, the, their front page is influencing the overall news cycle? The New York Times, I should say, on uh, in terms of news coverage, has done a pretty good job. Although I'm critical in other areas, John Burns is a very good reporter and did some of the best reporting uh, that I've seen from from Iraq. Um, the New York Times is particularly and has been for a long time influential in the sense that a lot of uh, TV producers um, and other newspaper editors read it and therefore it can sort of form the agenda for a lot of the news. I don't think it does it quite as effectively as it used to years ago, but it's still obviously one of the most important national papers and it does have that ability to sort of set the agenda. If it's on the New York Times front page, that means everybody's supposed to take it seriously and they generally do. Um, it doesn't necessarily follow if they put it on page 14 that nobody will take the story seriously, though, that can happen to. And did you watch a lot of the uh, ABC, CBS, or NBC television news coverage leading up to the intervention? Yeah, I think I probably did. And if you were good to kind of characterize the quality of the reporting that was done on the television news, what would you have to say? I saw too little uh, regarding what Saddam Hussein had done to that country and to that region in the past. Uh, to some extent, you can say, well, there aren't good pictures. But if some of it there are, you go on the internet and you look up Halabja, a town in, uh, in Kurdistan that Saddam Hussein wiped out with gas, you can find those pictures. Um, but I think there just there was not enough reporting on what happened to the Kurds, to the Marsh Arabs, to the Shia, and to the dissidents inside uh, Iraq under Saddam Hussein. And, and so that, in other words, is a, a sense of omission um, that yes. they did. And, could you kind of uh, talk about the coverage that you did see and how would you uh, evaluate that? Well, I can't recall any other specific well, complaints with the coverage. I guess, uh, with the military mobilizations, um, I guess uh, taking a step yeah. back, at, at what point uh, would you say that a, a military, that the, the mobilization was intended for um, enforcing the UN resolutions and then there seemed to be a point where it shifted to the forces there being intended for a liberation uh, action. At what point do you think that... that Look, I think that the legalistic argument always was, or was once the president made the decision to go to the UN, the legalistic argument was that Saddam Hussein was in violation of specific UN Security Council Chapter 7 resolutions and that we were going to, we, the United States, was going to, uh, the United States and the coalition of the willing, so to, as, as it's called, was going to take the role of enforcing those resolutions. Um, that was illegalistic. But that doesn't negate the possibility that there are other reasons to do this. If you went to the UN and said, we think we should um, secure regime change in Iraq because the people are so sorely oppressed by Saddam Hussein, he has killed so many of them, so many are languishing in dungeons, so many have been tortured, uh, it would not be considered a serious argument at the United Nations, unfortunately. It, right, and it, but it, who has a sovereign authority to enforce these resolutions? It's, it, it's not the individual member states, is it? Well, again, I'm not an international lawyer, but under Resolution 1441, uh, I think the argument would be that if Saddam did not comply, serious consequences would follow, and any member of the Security Council could lead the effort to bring those consequences to Saddam Hussein. But they didn't say that in 1441. It said serious consequences would follow. By tradition, somebody has to bring those consequences. You can argue, and I know some people do, that, oh, then you needed another resolution in order to make sure that that actually happened and to authorize that. Again, if you take that point of view, then you must also take the point of view that it was illegal for the United States to intervene in Bosnia and Kosovo without any UN authorization. I do not take the point of view, though I know some do, that you can only intervene when there is UN authorization. I do not see the United Nations as a world government in any sense. 
I don't think they're the last word on, on international legality, and so I don't think it's necessary to, to go to them and ask permission. I think the U.S. doesn't have to do that. I think they did in this case, and they can, and again, this is the argument that you can have international lawyers have, whether 1441 saying that Saddam had to comply or serious consequences would follow was sufficient for the U.S. to lead a coalition to intervene or whether there needed to be a subsequent resolution. You're right, if there had been a request for a subsequent resolution, it's obvious that, for example, the French would not have endorsed it. They would have vetoed that. We also, I think, know at this point that the French were involved in the UN Food for Oil pro program, which I think it's pretty clear was a corrupt program, probably and the largest instance of corruption in human history in dollar terms, so that the French, the Russians, and others were doing good business with Saddam Hussein, which may have influenced their decision as to whether or not he should be toppled and may have influenced their decision as to what international law said on this, on this matter. Well, the context of the debates around 1441 was debated for eight weeks over the very issue that the United States had explicit language authorizing military action. The French objected and then, you know, they, they said there's no hidden triggers and no automaticity and they said it's a two-stage process. So when you look at all that, that context, uh, and, and then those debates, I can't see how, you know, you can make the claim that serious consequences equals military action authorization. Uh, I, I understand that you don't see that serious consequences means military action. I might ask you, what do you think serious consequences does mean? Well, serious consequences, uh, it, there's explicit language. You know, you're, you're implying there's implicit language. It has to be explicit, say, by use, by all necessary means, is legally. The international lawyers would tell you that. Some international lawyers would. Some would not. Again, there is no judicial body that can give you an authoritative decision on this. Um, so I'll there. Yeah? Uh, take the number. I'll tell the call back very shortly. I'm almost finished here. And we're going to have to finish up here. We've got okay, another appointment. And, and when you look at um, kind of the, the journalistic uh, he said, she said um, type of uh, objectivity standards, uh, do you think that the press showed enough uh, skeptical viewpoints uh, leading up to the liberation? I haven't done a real study of it, and this was going back more than a year, so it's hard for me to say. I don't remember being outraged that there wasn't enough discussion of these issues. I think if you read a number of newspapers and magazines, you probably got a range of views. Okay. And um, let's see. Now, at one point, you said that there were, there's no doubt that Iraq has weapons of mass destruction. Do I say there's no doubt that, that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. How do I know that? Because he used chemical weapons against the Kurds and against the Iranians as well. As for developing biological weapons of mass destruction, we know that because his uh, son-in-law, Kamal Hussein, uh, among others, revealed that to be the case, and then, they, uh, then many of them were destroyed. I mean, a, a good quantity of his weapons of mass destruction were in fact destroyed uh, under the inspection regime. But there was a long list of unaccounted for weapons of mass destruction, anthrax and other things. And that's what in Resolution 1441 and other resolutions, he, it, the demand was that he produce those, account for those, and that they be destroyed in a verifiable manner. But are you aware that Hussein Kamal also uh, said in 1996 that they also destroyed all the weapons of mass destruction in 1991? Um, no, I'm not aware of that. Uh, in, 19, in fact, after 1995, we found some of those biological weapons of mass destruction of memory serves. Uh, on September, uh, February 24, 2002, Newsweek reported this, that Hussein Kamel had also said this. Was he back in Iraq at that point? He had already defected. Uh, this is the, de de the debriefing in, in Jordan that happened by the, uh, both the UNSCOM and uh, the CIA MI6. It was reported on February 24th that he had also said that they destroyed all the weapons. So you think he was lying when he first said that there were these weapons, or you think they had all been destroyed, or you're thinking he would necessarily know this? He said both. He uh -huh. said we have them, but we also destroyed them. Well, uh, based as, I, as, as memory reserves, after he revealed the weapons in 1995, biological weapons were found and biological weapons were destroyed. That means from 1991 to 1995, at the very least, Saddam Hussein was hiding those biological weapons from the inspectors in violation of the agreements he undertook. And when you look at why the United States uh, went to war, do you feel that, uh, you know, what, what's from your sense why we went to war? I went to war for a number of reasons, um, but basically because Saddam Hussein seemed to be uh, a threat to the United States. Um, 
that we didn't want to tolerate uh, in the wake and in the light of what had happened to us in 9-11. And again, I would say that throughout the 1990s, w there were terrorists being trained to kill us. We did nothing about that. They didn't have weapons of mass destruction, but they killed about 3,000 Americans on September 11th, 2001. Um, after that, I think it is, I think that we should look differently on those who declare themselves to be our enemies, as Saddam Hussein did, swear revenge against us, as Saddam Hussein did, um, and, uh, and may have the capability to meet those intentions. Again, we don't have to do that. The other policy, and I urge people to debate it, is to say, no, after we're attacked by suicide terrorists, then we can try to find out who's responsible and bring them to justice. It's another point of view. And uh, from where we're at right now, what is your vision for uh, a world peace and what we need to do to get to that point? Well, I think right now there are a number of totalitarian ideologies uh, that you might want to group under the generic term jihadism. These are radical Islamism, which is not Islam. It is rather a political ideology um, that claims its legitimacy from Islam. Um, they have dedicated themselves to the destruction of the United States and other free world countries. Uh, we're fighting a war against these folks, or they're fighting a war against us. It was in 1996 that Osama bin Laden declared war against the United States. We didn't respond to that very forcefully or effectively, obviously. I think at this point we have to, we are in a global conflict against terrorists driven by ideologies of hatred and ideologies that seek to destroy us. We want to understand those ideologies, but I don't think we can appease them. I certainly don't think we should reward them. I think we will have to defeat them. In the 20th century, we fought similar ideologies, fascism, communism, Nazism. They saw it, they were all totalitarian ideologies. They all were against the basic freedoms we enjoy, um, and they sought to destroy us. Um, we prevailed. I think if we understand the totalitarian ideologies that once again are seeking to defeat the United States and other free world nations, then we can prevail and defend ourselves against them as well. And does the United States government have an official definition for terrorism? And if so? Well, I do. I don't know. <laughs> I think terrorism is the intentional targeting uh, of innocent civilians, or non, even just non-combatants, the targeting with, with violence of civilians for political purposes. I think that should be beyond the pale. I think that should be something that nobody accepts. I think it should be clear that terrorism always sets back the causes it claims to champion. I understand terrorism has been used in the past, and in the past there have been plenty of people who have accepted terrorism as a tool of war but we've also accepted slavery and piracy and genocide. Morally, I think we've evolved past that in terms of slavery, piracy, and genocide. We know why that. I would like to think we no longer accept those practices. I think the same should be true of terrorism, of intentionally targeting innocent civilians. I think that no matter what your grievance, no matter what your complaint, you do not express it by murdering other people's children. In the State Department, do they define the global war on terrorism as being uh, only international terrorism actions? Is there a distinction that the State Department makes between uh, terrorism of ki killing civilians uh, versus international organizations like Al-Qaeda? And, and well, I'm, I'm, I think, that, well, though I think you need to address it to the State Department, that terrorism is committed by an organization. If a state does it, some people would call it state terrorism, more likely would be called either a war crime or a crime against humanity. Again, these are definitional. Um, a state can sponsor terrorism, but if a state sends out its army, for example, to kill innocent children, that's probably definitionally a war crime. And uh, I guess uh, when, when Saddam Hussein, is he sub what kind of terrorism did he support? He sponsored, he sponsored terrorism. I don't think there's any question about that. Baghdad was terrorism central for a generation. He hosted terrorists. He had a terrorist training camp at Salman Pak. Again, it had a fuselage of, a, of an airplane there. Maybe some people think that was to train uh, airline attendants to do beverage service, but I greatly doubt it. He visited that camp. He told the terrorists that were being trained there, both Iraqi terrorists and foreign terrorists, that when they graduated, their job was to attack, in particular, American interests. Um, he 
paid for terrorism, uh, rewarding the families of suicide bombers uh, in the West Bank against Israel. Um, I, I, I think, I mean, I don't think there's real, I don't think there's any serious question that he was the spo a state sponsor of terrorism. And the importance about state sponsorship of terrorism, I think, is this, that terrorist groups that have no state sponsorship will be on the run, will not be comfortable, will have difficulty getting funds and fake IDs and, uh, and, and, and weapons, whether we conventional weapons or weapons of mass destruction. Um, so they can still do damage, but it's less. But when terrorist groups have state sponsorship, they can mount much more sophisticated operations. So I think it's very important that states not sponsor terrorism. And the states that do sponsor terrorism, uh, I think, are at, at war with us. Okay. And let's see. I think that might be it there.